Hello everyone and welcome back to Towergate. It is Towergate day number 994. 994, Sunday, December the 22nd, 2019. Thank you so much for tuning in this Sunday morning. Okay, another day, another, uh, I guess you'd say another packed day of uh, new information. So let's go ahead and get into it here. Uh, the first thing, uh, remember, to get in your votes this week for Dumbass of the Week in the comments section of this video. Now, I'm thinking that's gonna be a pretty easy call for most people. I would not, uh, I'll be very surprised if it's not a certain person that I think we're all thinking of for Dumbass of the Week. Um, <clears throat> so make sure to get your comments in for uh, your votes in for Dumbass of the Week on the comments section in this video. Alrighty, uh, let's see. Yes, the first story, it's a a bombshell from Sundance over at Conservative Treehouse. And he has discovered um, an email and the response to an email um, that is very, very damning. Very damning. So let's just go through it uh, here real quickly and then uh, we'll kind of uh, hedge it out. So <clears throat> Sundance has discovered this uh, bombshell text uh, that was originally a text, the original sender was Peter's been stroking us, and then it's the response by Lisa Page, uh, and the email was CC'd to several of the players in the small group, which would have, of course, been Peter's been stroking us, Lucy Lisa Page, Bill Priestap, Jonathan Maffa. Okay, so um, Page, in this particular, uh, there's two there's the initial email and there's the response. So um, the response, let's hit the response first, is that uh, in this particular case, it's Lisa Page that is responding to an email that Peter has been stroking us had just sent out. And that email from Peter has been stroking us said, quote, CNN update per rich, CNN to publish, C material. Today between four and five. CNN to publish C material today between four and five. This was sent by um, this was sent by uh, Peter's been stroking us. And when he's referring to C material, he is referring to crown, C-R-O-W-N, crown material. Crown material was the term that was used by the FBI small group to, um, that's the name they gave to what later became known as the Steele dossier, which at that time was still in memo form. Remember, there were 16 individual memos that were fed to the FBI, the State Department, uh, which later when all put together, became the Steele dossier. So here we have Peter's been stroking us, telling his other small group members that uh, CNN was going to do the story, and Jake Tapper uh, was the person who's going to do the story, where they were going to, uh, and, and now he says CNN to publish the C material, meaning he would be talking about published the dossier, but in fact, that's not what exactly happened. Uh, Jake Tapper did the story that Comey had briefed Trump on the so-called crown material, the so-called steel dossier, or some parts of it. That was, as we now know, the news hook that CNN needed. And then CNN's story provided BuzzFeed with what they needed to publish the dossier the following day. The whole thing was a plot. Feed CNN the story that Comey was briefing Trump on the dossier so that CNN could then report on it as an actual news story. And based on that, BuzzFeed could then feel free to publish the dossier. So what this proves, now before I get into that, let me get the follow-up from Luce Lisa Page. Now keep in mind, um, this email by Peter's been stroking us, and this is very, very important, the time. The time that Peter's been stroking us sent out this email saying CNN to publish C material today between four and five. 
he sent that email on January the 10th, 2017 at 3.20 p.m. 3.20 p.m. About 40 minutes prior to Jake Tapper coming on the air to do the story that Peter's been stroking us is telling them about. He's saying, hey, uh, Tapper on CNN at, uh, at um, 4 o'clock, but somewhere between 4 and 5, is going to break the story about Comey briefing Trump on the dossier material, the crown material. And of course, they already knew that that's what was going to provide the, uh, the opportunity for BuzzFeed to release the dossier the next day. Clearly, this entire thing was a plot. Now, that email goes out, as I just said, at about 3.20 p.m. Then, shortly after that, uh, within literally a minute of that, we get the response from Lisa Page. And she responds to that email by saying, quote, we have lots of details from Corton. We will brief, or he will brief, at 3.45. So at 3.20, Peter has been stroking us, is telling them that Tapper is going to run the story at somewhere between 4 and 5 p.m. Then, just a few moments later, you have Loose Lisa Page respond to that, saying that Mike Corton is going to brief them all at 345, and he has lots of details. Now keep in mind, Michael Corton uh, was at that time the director of uh, communications, media communications for the FBI. He was also the person who worked with Lisa Page to write those two articles, which they, uh, on behalf of Andy McCabe, which they leaked to Devlin Barrett at the, I think, Wall Street Journal. So, Strzok, Page, and the others in the small group knew that Jake Tapper of CNN was going to run the story. They knew that uh, well ahead of time. Clearly, Peter's been stroking us, leaked the story to Jake Tapper. And that's, of course, what led to BuzzFeed uh, publishing the dossier the following day on January 11th, 2017. So this is bombshell because this clearly shows there can be no denying that Peter's been stroking us and these folks in the small group all knew that Tapper at CNN was going to do the story. And how would he have known to do the story about the briefing unless he had been told. And how would Peter's been, stro been, been stroking us know that Tapper was going to do the story? Unless he's the one that actually is the one who uh, gave the information to Tapper that the that Comey briefing at the Trump Tower had occurred. And we know that James Clapper also communicated uh, with Jake Tapper. He admitted to that and even said that he may have com uh, commuted, communicated with other people about this topic as well. So it's not really clear at this point whether Peter's been stroking us directly uh, leaked that to uh, Jake Tapper or whether he was just in the um, in the click with Clapper and maybe others who were all working together on the plot to get this information to CNN so they could run the story so BuzzFeed could release the dossier. So this is very, very damning for all of these people who were in that email chain. Peter's been stroking us, Luce Lisa Page, Michael Corton, um, Jonathan Moffa, and that's all the names that we see on the CC just because of the way it gets cut off. But we can assume that other members of the small group were probably included Certainly, Priestap uh, was was his name is there, so you do see Priestap, but very likely uh, McCabe also would have been uh, cc'd on this as well, and probably a couple of others. So this eliminates any possibility for uh, the people in the small group to pretend that they did not know uh, anything about uh, 
the sources for CNN's uh, story about Trump being briefed uh, at Trump Tower by Comey about the so-called crown material, which is the dossier material or the Christopher Steele information. So uh, there goes any defense of that. And again, it would require a little more digging and questioning to find out exactly who else would have been, you know, a part of this, would have had this knowledge. But we know for sure that Peter's been stroking us and these people CC'd on this email absolutely knew it. They're busted. They're not going to be able to deny this. And that makes it a plot. That makes it a conspiracy. They conspired with this media organization, CNN, to uh, give this information to CNN that Trump was briefed by Comey at Trump Tower about the so-called crown material, the Steele dossier material. And why did they do that? Why did they do it? Well, as we've heard before, because uh, CNN uh, and the FBI, the people running the coup, needed some sort of a news hook. They wanted the media to be able to run with this, but the media could not run with it because it needed to have some sort of news value to it, and they wanted to cover their ass. And so this is why they did it this way, is so that they could provide a news hook. And the news hook, the CNN, was step one to, to get this information to step one, uh, to CNN is step one, and step two is now that they've got the news hook, they've run the story, then BuzzFeed can feel legally like they can release the dossier because now it's a news story. See, they wanted the dossier released, but they had to figure out how to do it. And this is the plot they came up with for how to do it. This in itself is just one of the many uh, sort of micro conspiracies within the overall macro conspiracy. See, we have a giant conspiracy here, and within it, we have many, many dozens and dozens of smaller conspiracies that all sort of uh, uh, are part of the larger conspiracy. So this is very damning because this certainly shows uh, foreknowledge and intent. We already have the motive, and of course we have the action. Uh, what what took place? What did happen? They acted on it. Have you get this? If you get this email, but there's no action, then it doesn't mean much. If you have the action, but you don't have any evidence of foreknowledge, it doesn't have much, you know, to do. But here you have all the elements that you need to prove this little conspiracy as part of a wider conspiracy. And if we know about this, if uh, Sundance has now discovered this. Certainly, Durham's investigators have discovered it long ago. So this is very, very damning. Very damning. All of these people who were read in, CC'd on this email, knew about this, and therefore they are part of the conspiracy. And this is a, this is criminal right here, what they're doing here. This is criminal. Um, this would certainly be an illegal leak, and this is probably also what Devin Nunes was referring to when he made those referrals on several people and then the three buckets that he talked about where he described seeing, uh, he didn't specifically say FBI, but he described uh, basically uh, the coup plotters essentially uh, leaking information. For, to provide a pretext for some action to be taken. So this lays it out just as clear as it can possibly be. It cannot be any clearer than what you have in this email and the email responses. Peter's been stroking us, sending out the email more than an hour before CNN Jake Tapper's show aired, saying what Tapper was going to say and what he was going to reveal. Therefore, they had foreknowledge. And then, of course, you have the response by Luce Lisa Page that Corton, Michael Corton, uh, the assistant director of media communications for the FBI, is going to give them a briefing, and he has lots of details. You can expect that uh, Mr. Durham is going to want to have a talk with Mr. Corton to find out what that <laughs> lots of details is all about. Meanwhile, these individuals here are facing indictments for criminal conspiracy. 
and of course leaking classified information. And it's the reason, the motive for leaking the classified information is where the criminal conspiracy takes place. So these people all have a lot of problems. As I keep saying, dozens, dozens, I'm saying two to three dozen people will be indicted by John Durham on multiple counts. These people are not just facing a perjury charge here and there. No, no, no. These people are all facing multiple counts, including including a criminal conspiracy. This is slam dunk stuff, my friends. Now, again, uh, a lot of people will look at this and say, man, these people cannot be this stupid. They can't be guilty of anything criminal because they're, they're not stupid enough uh, to, to text about this kind of stuff and to do the type of things they did. I mean, they would certainly have known they were going to get caught, right? Wrong. Remember, at the time when all this is occurring, uh, this is uh, all occurring um, at a time when the decision to carry out the coup had already been made. Trump, uh, the attempt to stop him from being elected, uh, had already failed. And now, uh, keep in mind, as they're, as they're attempting to uh, destroy Trump to keep him from winning, their mindset is they're going to succeed. That there's no way that Trump is going to beat Hillary. It's Everyone knows Hillary's going to win. But once Trump wins and they realize, uh-oh, wow, we're busted. What are we going to do now? Well, enact the insurance policy. Carry out the coup. And that's where Uncle Bob the Executioner comes in. He also has a lot of problems because he had access to every bit of this. Mueller's investigation should have uncovered the plot. Should have uncovered the plot. So now they find themselves in a situation where Trump uh, has won the election and now they know they're screwed because now they know that they left behind uh, a massive uh, trail of breadcrumbs that leads right back to them and the crimes that they committed. So they really have no choice but to go all out. They have nothing to lose at this point. They might as well go for the uh, coup. So there you go. Credit to Sundance for finding that uh, email. I'm sure Bar Durham's people have already discovered it and are probably already, if not interviewed Corton about this, probably will get to it uh, in short order. Okay, we have uh, some other news here. Uh, Attorney General Barr is calling out George Soros for pumping money into American elections to elect people who are not very supportive of law enforcement and don't view the office as one that should be prosecuting criminals. <laughs> well, that's nice to know that Attorney General Barr, uh, I think he's been aware of Soros for a long time, but this is the very first time I've heard him ever comment on the activities of George Soros. And he needs to shut that stuff down inside the United States. Can't do anything about what he does over in Europe. Uh, that's up to Europe. But here in the U.S., they need to shut down George Soros. Well, we have another report from Catherine Herridge, uh, where she tells us that Peter Strzok has said that he, quote, believed that the FBI may have furnished the steel election reports to the intelligence services of a friendly foreign government, but he has no specific recollection. <laughs> Peter's been stroking and saying that he believes that the FBI may have furnished the steel election reports to the intelligence service of a friendly foreign government. Hmm. Are you sure it wasn't the other way around, Pete? We're going to find out. We also have Judicial Watch reporting today that uh, Andy McCabe told the Inspector General that President Obama requested everything relevant uh, be included in the 2017 ICA, the Intelligence Community Assessment, which is the document that laid the groundwork for the Mueller investigation and the initiation of the coup plot. Obama knew 
everything. More evidence, and now coming directly from Andy McCabe. And what do you know? Here we have Steve Bannon, uh, Maria Bartiromo, telling her that he's absolutely certain that the Rotten Reverend is going to be running. And he even talked about her strategy, which he said is the brokered convention strategy. He's obviously been watching my videos, because I've never heard anyone talk about that before. I've heard Bannon say he thinks Hillary's going to run, but it's the first time I've heard someone, besides me, lay out the fact that she's going to do it by way of brokered convention. So we're watching Joe Biden, and you've got to ask yourself, why is he not pulling away from the field? The rest of the field is absolutely unelectable. He's a terrible candidate, but he's got name recognition. He was the former vice president. He can tap into a ton of corporate money, and he would have some degree of legitimacy uh, at his, at, because of his sort of stature, his previous positions. I don't think that makes him terribly electable. I just think it makes him reasonably electable, while the rest of the field really isn't. But he can't seem to pull away because he keeps doing stupid things saying stupid things that, that won't allow him to tap into the larger uh, network or larger body of the so-called moderate or business Democrats. It's almost like just as he starts to pull ahead and get a little bit of a lead, he gets pulled back to the left. And I keep saying there's someone in the Biden campaign advising him to sabotage himself. You know, someone is making sure that Biden cannot get a clear majority. So that when he shows up at the convention, there is no clear uh, person with the majority, and therefore they'll have a brokered convention. When that happens, all bets are off. Anyone's name can be put forward to be voted on, and that means a rotten Reverend Clinton's name will be brought forward, despite the fact she never participated in any debates, went through the primaries or anything else. She can literally be written in, and they can vote on that. And you can bet that a week or two before that, They'll be showing all kinds of polls showing that everyone gets trounced against Trump except for the rotten reverend. That she either beats him or she's in a dead heat or something like that. This will all be set up beforehand. And it's becoming obvious to me that Biden and Warren and some of these other what we would consider top tier candidates definitely have Clinton allies operating within them and they're advising these candidates to take positions that won't allow any of them to break away from the field because they get sucked back in to something that they shouldn't have said. So we just had these debates on Friday night. I assume no one watched. Um, but in that debate, Biden doubled down on what he said earlier last week. And he basically said, yeah, I would be willing to give up hundreds of thousands of good paying American blue collar type jobs to pursue the environmentalist agenda. And he said, yeah, well, well, they, they won't need those jobs anymore uh, because they'll have good jobs in the green energy. <laughs> Where have we heard that before? Now keep in mind, the rotten Reverend Clinton said in her book that her single greatest mistake was going into the Midwest and saying that she was going to um, get rid of the coal industry, put the coal industry out of business which has a lot of other related industries with it. She said that was her biggest mistake. Biden came out and repeated that just two weeks ago, and then Friday night in the debate, he doubles down on it. Because Warren started slipping. When Bert Bloomberg came in, he pulled votes from Buttigieg. Sanders has found his ceiling. He cannot, there's really nowhere else for him to go. He's about as high as he can get. So, the Rotten Reverend and other people watching know that at some point there just simply isn't going to be anyone else uh, enter the race. They're going to get up to the time with the primaries and people are going to finally have to make a decision and they're probably going to have to hold their nose and go for Biden. Because really he's the only one that you can consider could seriously uh, be on the stage with Trump in debates and, and even run for president, and he's got the name recognition, was the former VP. He's the only what you would consider viable candidate, really. The Rotten Reverend knows this, and she knows that she has to make sure that Biden does not get the majority of vote. Uh, that way, he, if he gets to the convention, he doesn't have, they can have a brokered convention. 
The rotten reverend wants to make sure that the the Biden can never break out from the rest of the field. And someone is advising him to take positions that will put him exactly in that position. So I've been saying since the day after the 2016 election that uh, 2020 will be a rematch between the rotten reverend and President Trump. And about two months ago, three months ago, is when I first began thinking that the rotten Reverend Clinton was going to use a brokered convention strategy because I'm pretty convinced she's not going to enter into the debates. She's not going to register for any of the primaries. She's shown no indication she's going to register to compete in any one of the primary states. So her only possible way left to get in, and we know she wants to get in, is through a brokered convention. And I think that she and her operatives probably planted into the campaigns of Biden, Warren, uh, maybe others, are working to achieve that outcome. That's what it looks like. I could be wrong, but that's what it looks like. Well, what do you know? The popular consensus is, as of today, that President Trump officially has not been impeached. It appears now, and we have Alan Dershowitz making probably the best argument. He picked up on where this other this this uh, left wing lawyer, uh, no whatever his name was, uh, picked up on his op ed, and he's taken it a couple steps farther uh, into the constitutional requirements for impeachment and what impeachment really means. And Dershowitz is sort of agreeing, but taking it even farther, saying no. Once the vote is held, that's the the House's work is over. It's officially now in the Senate's court. And yes, the Senate can say, okay, you had the vote. We're going to go ahead and schedule the hearings. And it's assumed that the articles of impeachment will be on their way. But once uh, once, uh, McConnell decides the date on when to begin the hearings, he will send Pelosi a letter saying, hey, we're going to begin the hearings on such and such a date contact my office so that we can make arrangements to get your managers over here and uh, lay out how we're going to do the hearings. And it's not up to Pelosi. She has nothing to say about it. It's totally McConnell's business at this point. And he's going to inform Pelosi when the date is going to be, when they're going to have the hearings. And he'll also mention to her, and by the way, we haven't received your articles yet, so we have to have them by that morning. If, in fact, the articles don't show up by this day that I've informed you is the day the hearing is going to start. The hearing doesn't go on. We adjourn the hearings and that's the end of it. It's canceled. The impeachment is canceled. And according to Dershowitz, as of right now, there is no official impeachment. There has been a vote in the House, but until the, the Senate actually bangs the gavel and begins the hearings, there's no official impeachment. Yes, and speaking of the Rotten Reverend, we had the Rotten Reverend still out there on our book tour uh, dressed in this crazy blue polka dot uh, Chairman Mao type mumu. Uh, and she doesn't look well. She looks like she's gained about 150 pounds or something. She's almost as rotund as she is. T- in fact, I think she probably is rounder than she is tall. And then she got the Botox thing, and that's that looks weird. I mean, she just looks weird. And that's what doing a lot of drinking will do to you. Um, And what's crazy about it is that she's basically praising Nancy Pelosi for her, you know, uh, you know, execution of this impeachment. I guess she hasn't gotten the word that Pelosi botched it and that the impeachment isn't official at all. Essentially, it didn't happen. Until she passes those articles over, there is no impeachment. So apparently the Rotten Reverend didn't get the message. But what makes it even more maddening is as she's finishing up this little statement. There's a YouTube video. You can watch it. It's only about a minute long. She goes into this diatribe about about what upsets her so much about this deal with Ukraine and Trump is the national security. She says, yes, that he put national security at risk. <laughs> yes, the rotten reverend who set up a private server in her bathroom, uh, completely uh, unprotected, 
uh, that everybody was hacking, everybody was getting into, and she's worrying about Trump and national security when his deal with with uh, Ukraine had nothing to do with national security other than providing Ukraine with the weapons that they needed and wanted, which he did, and which the Obama administration under she and John Kerry would not. I mean, it's just bizarro world. But the rotten Reverend Clinton continues to believe that she is relevant. And, you know, I would not be surprised if the brokered convention strategy succeeds in, as far as her getting her name on the ballot. But do not be surprised if once her name is put on the ballot and they have the vote, do not be surprised if she doesn't get enough votes herself to uh, even eclipse Biden. She might, I mean, just because she can get her name on the ballot at the convention and she can twist a lot of elbows and then get the superdelegates to vote for her and they can do a lot of things, doesn't necessarily mean that all those delegates are going to fall in line doesn't necessarily mean she's going to succeed at winning in a broker convention. It only guarantees that she'll get on the ballot. doesn't guarantee she'll win, and I would not be the least bit surprised, even if she does get on the ballot, that she is not able to pull it off, which will be horribly embarrassing for the Rotten Reverend. And by the way, uh, John Durham is going to be having a, a, making an appointment with her as well, you can bet. So, yeah, she's not out of the woods at all. Uh, she's definitely a huge part of the criminal conspiracy and uh, she's probably too arrogant to think that she probably believes she's untouchable. But I don't know. With, with John Durham, once he starts digging and he realizes that she's a crucial part of the criminal conspiracy, he's going to want to know from the Rotten Reverend, directly from her mouth, what she knew and when she knew it. Of course, it is very interesting that Mike Rogers is cooperating with uh, John Durham, and that's important for... The main thing that excites me about that is that now we know for sure that Durham is going to be told by Rogers uh, about those private contractors accessing the uh, NSA database via the FBI systems because that occurred back in the fall of 2015. And that also is uh, exactly what Nunes uh, sent over to the DOJ uh, is one of his buckets. That's one of the things he was talking about. Remember, Nunez went over to a skiff and he and he saw all those hundreds and hundreds, maybe thousands of people's names who had been queried through the seven, through the uh, database. He could see that these people were private citizens. They were all connected in some way to the Trump campaign. All of it was political and personal conversation. There was nothing there had anything to do with Russia, national security, or anything else. It was just spying on people on the Trump campaign. It was being authorized by either the Attorney General or Deputy Attorney General, which would have been Lynch or Yates, to allow th these private contractors to have access to that database. Uh, I haven't heard too much about that uh, since, you know, about two, two years ago when we discovered it, but now uh, we have Mike Rogers talking to Durham, I'm absolutely 100% certain that he is going to inform Durham about that. And I'm sure Durham will find that very interesting. And of course, um, it's also another thing that's uh, very important is that we now know that he's looking into Mr. Potato Head John Brennan. And what's important about this, as I have said for a very, very long time, is that in the late spring, somewhere in the last week of March, the first week of April, somewhere in that range, John Brennan set up this secretive six-agency or multi-agency task force. It was made up of about six different departments, the most secretive departments of the government, the DOJ NSD, the FBI um, NSB, uh, the Treasury, uh, a couple other uh, departments, and bringing together people from all these various departments to work together essentially on the coup. And Peter's been stroking us and Andy McCabe were definitely in that group. So. The, the thing that Durham is trying to discover is the origins, and he's also trying to find out how, how the intelligence side of it got mixed in with the criminal part of it, with the FBI and the counterintelligence. Well, this is where it occurred. It occurred in this multi-agency task force that Brennan set up, and that is where the two were joined together and why you had this relationship going on and why you have this questions over is it. Is it CIA? Is it intelligence? Or is it FBI? Which is it? Well, it's both. Because Brennan had brought the two together, had, had sort of immersed them together. And that's why it's hard to untangle. 
But now that Durham is getting into Brennan, he's going to find out about the multi-agency task force, and that's going to explain where the synergy uh, came from, and from there, it'll be much easier to sort things out. Thanks so much for tuning